Coming up on today's Green Signals, West Coast Railway Company suspends sales of Jacobite steam train tickets, the famous Harry Potter route across Glenfinnan Viaduct amid another battle with the ORR about doors. Andy Street and Andy Burnham unveil their alternative to HS2, but is it really a viable alternative? More strike days announced by Aslef. And some good news, hooray, on passenger numbers. Rail journeys are up by 20%. Hello and welcome to Green Signals from me, Nigel Harris, and I'll let him tell you where he is. Oh, I'm still here in Wiltshire. It's uh, me, Richard Bowker, uh, although it's quite, um, it's quite a grey day today. Spring seems to have taken a, 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 brief, uh, a brief wander off. OK. I was briefly tempted to put you in Clackmannanshire or somewhere, but resisted the temptation. Uh-huh. Anyway, if you enjoy this episode, please give it the usual thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube, which really does help us to produce more of what you want and enhance the quality of the show or followers, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're listening on Spotify. Quite apart from letting us know that you like what we do, it really does help us to grow the channel and ensure that we can keep bringing you more of what you like. Steph's been doing some research and has turned up that the average YouTube channel reaches a thousand subscribers in around 22 months, getting on for two years. But we're all astonished and pleased to say that we did that in just three months. And that's all down to your amazing support. So thank you. And please join us if you're not yet subscribed. We really do promise to make it worth your while. And speaking of support from viewers, we've had a fantastic first this last week, haven't we, Richard? We have. We got our very first super thanks, which uh, which was lovely. I had no idea what a super thanks was when Steph called me very excited to tell me we'd have one. <laughs> well, to be honest, I wasn't entirely sure myself, but it's it, uh, I now know now it, it's like YouTube's equivalent of let me buy you a coffee. Let me say, you know, well done. Um, and it, it kind of allows viewers to sort of say thank you to us and, you know, be a very small donation that, as I say, is just mm-hmm. is, is a really nice thing. And the first one we got this week was from Steve Payne, 1369, who, who said this. It was lovely. He said, thanks, yeah. Nigel and Richard. The best UK rail news channel there is. Oh, informative and entertaining from two railway legends and true gentlemen. Well, thank you. Well, that well, was really nice. <laughs> it was. I mean, we we try to be gentlemen. I'm, I find myself slightly uncomfortable at legends, but hey, you know, Steve said it, so we've reported it. <laughs> but it uh, it is, and it what it does is it's it's a way of making a small contribution to Green Signals running cost, doesn't it? <laughs> it does indeed. Thank you, Steve. Well, hopefully, and this is a hint, to everybody out there. Hopefully, Steve started a trend. So reach for the coffee button. I love coffee. Um, is there a is there a pint of best bitter button available as well? Uh, we'll have a look. I'm not okay. sure. I doubt it, but we'll have a All go. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, without further ado, let's go on with the news. Um, and we start with a big one. The West Coast Railway Company has pulled its Jacobite steam train ticket sales. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Jacobite train, made famous as the Hogwarts Express in the Harry Potter films, is back in the news this week, and not for a good way. And the story shows no sign of cooling off. Indeed, quite the reverse. It seems that the uh, the ante, as they say, has been upped. First, just a quick recap. So bear with me. Are you sitting comfortably? In 1999, legislation was passed that would lead to the banning of railway carriages with hinged doors, known as slam door stock, although exemptions were possible for those operators using slam door trains and carriages on the national network. This was all part of getting rid of Mark 1s on the national network. Sure enough, a number of charter train operators continued to run using exemptions including West Coast Railways, operator of the Jacobite steam train. However, gradually, other charter operators of slam door vehicles have been investing the necessary capital to fit 
what is known as central door locking or CDL. Now, this system ensures that the doors can all be locked and unlocked remotely by the guard so that passengers cannot open the doors once CDL is activated. Um, if those of you remember traveling on HSTs, you may well remember the clunk of all the solenoids as you waited for the uh, to get to climb out the doors, because that's all it is. It's just a solenoid that shoots a bolt into the door frame. Last year, the ORR notified West Coast Railways that they would not receive any further exemptions in the absence of a clear plan to fit CDL on their slam door trains as the first deadline had passed on March 31st, 2023. In response, West Coast Railways, who have long maintained that their approach is just as safe, took the ORR to court using a ju judicial review and not only lost, but lost comprehensively. As a result, the ORR removed the exemption and West Coast Railways were left unable to operate their slam door trains. Didn't stop them carrying on selling tickets for the 2024 season of their Jacobite steam train, however. But now there's been more news and um, Richard with Steph's help has really been digging deeply into this. So over to you, Richard. Thanks. Well, one thing just, I think, just bear in mind, um, the, the deadline of the 31st of March 23 was actually the final deadline, right? Yes. Um, and and it's a, something that's been going on for many, many years, bearing in mind that regulations um, that banned uh, slam door stock, hinged door rolling stock with drop light windows, um, goes back to 1999, as you say. So this is not something not that's... Oh, heavens, no, this is not something that came up last week. So, uh, look, you've summarised the background of that really well. That That's exactly where things have got to, and they lost the judicial review. We might talk a little bit about the judicial review and, and what was said, because it was a pretty comprehensive um, And indeed, actually, decision. on the 1999 point, I do remember when they came in um, asking about the charter train stuff, and the ORR made clear that these were exemptions that at some point they would have to be converted or scrapped. They made it clear that this was not a forever thing. Okay, so that that's where we've got to. The, the forever's come to an end, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> on the 21st of March, um, so this is, you know, last week, West Coast Railways said that they were disappointed to have to suspend the service, the Jacobite service. We're sorry for the inconvenience that's been caused. Um, and they made the point, and this is correct, the Jacobite service railway uh, steam train is something that is is enjoyed by thousands of people, right, uh, every year. Um, it, it unquestionably adds value to the local economy and the national economy. There's some discussion over just how much, but it definitely adds some value. Oh, it does. And what West Coast Railways said was, we really hope that the ORR will grant us a further exemption. Um, because they could be all this value could be lost, and then they said we remain committed um, to working with the ORR to find an, a long term solution. Incidentally, Richard, Scotland's Mister Railways, Bill Reeve, has told me on more, more than one occasion that the Jacobite is the only passenger train in Scotland that he doesn't have to subsidise. There you go. So um, it, it is a valuable asset both for West Coast Railway uh, Company and also for the Scottish economy. Now the ORR responded to that from the 21st of March in quite a quite a strong way, you know. They said they made it clear they said all railway operators, all heritage operators were told several years ago that 31st of March 2023 was the final deadline. And I went and had a look at actually at that in the um in the judicial review decision uh, the uh, ORR, well actually the the the, the, the judgment says uh, on 9th of May 2019, so that's nearly four years ago, the ORR wrote to all heritage train operators explaining the ORR would not be issuing further exemptions from the prohibition in Regulation 5, that's the relating to uh, hinge, uh, hinge doors, after the 31st of March 2023. So they got stacks of notice, okay? They were very clear, and that whole JR was very sharp in its tone, wasn't it? It, it it didn't really leave much. Well, on the one hand, this; on the one hand, that. No. We'll, we're, again, there's some other points that are interesting in it. But 
The ORR carried on last week and said, West Coast Railway's application for an exemption failed and they made a claim for judicial review, which obviously we, we know about. They then got a temporary exemption to allow the litigation to run on in parallel, because of course, I suppose West Coast Railway could have won. So they carried on with, the, with their exemption. But here's the interesting thing the ORR said. Despite this, um, West Coast Railways chose to sell tickets when it was far from certain a new application for an exemption would be granted, either in time for the commencement of services or at all. Or right? even at all, yeah. Or at all. Um, and the ORR said they submitted, West Coast Railways submitted their exemption application on the 8th of March. Now, these things can normally take quite a lot of time, so that was arguably leaving it pretty late anyway. This is the killer point. ORR is disappointed that West Coast Railway appears not to have made sensible contingency plans for the benefit of their customers. In other words, you carried on selling tickets when the future was far from Ouch. clear. Ouch, that's very damning, isn't that's it? That's quite strong, right? So now, if you look on the West Coast Railway's website, uh, as of yesterday, on the 25th of March, it says, we're sorry that we've had to cancel trips on the Jacobite. Um, we're unable to offer alternative trips on the Jacobite steam train at this time. All refunds will be paid by the payment method, blah, blah, blah. Now, here's the interesting point. This suspension of this service is due to a debate with the rail regulator around, well, West Coast Railway's words, right? Um, With the rail regulator around door locking, we share the regulator's commitment to safety and our priority now is to work with it to renew permission to enable us to run the Jacobite on the main uh, line. And then it says, we hope to uh, be able to operate scheduled service in the future, but please note bookings for the Jacobite are closed until further notice. So that that's the position of today. And it, it does kind of feel, as you said in your introduction, it's almost as if they're, they're not they're not coming closer together. The the, the sort of the, the lines are being drawn even more definitively. Well those three words from West Coast to renew permission yeah. clearly says they've no intention of fitting CDL. Um well the ORR have said consistently, and again, this was in the judicial review. Let's go back to that. In the judicial review, uh, the ORR said, and I just need to find a bit because there's lots and lots of uh, stuff in this document. Um, it is quite, it's quite a lot of paper. Oh, here we go. Right. The ORR has made clear that it is willing to allow a transition period for the retrofitting of central door locking as it has done with other operators which would enable central door locking to be fitted out of season, which is a bit of a problem now, but anyway, thereby avoiding loss of revenue, right? So... um, They were being reasonable. We'll give you time to make the switch. But I suppose you could argue that uh, West Coast Railway saying we're we're trying to renew permission could be either we don't want to fit CDL or... We're going to, but we need a transition plan. And in the meantime, would you give us a transitional exemption, right? So uh, both of those are are technically possible, right? I think it's just worth bearing that, bearing that in mind. It is. Now, West Coast Railways have always maintained that their approach of secondary door locking is perfectly safe. Um, and just by way of a quick explainer, what that means is that every opening door on every Mark 1 uh, to give passengers access to the train, is fitted with a very sturdy sliding, I think they're brass bolts, a bit like you put on the inside of your bathroom door. Um, and every door under that system has to have a steward who will unlock that sliding bolt when a train gets to a station to allow passengers to disembark. And then when they've all got back in again, he or she will relock that door. Now, you can have a debate about, you know, it's open for people to mess with the bolts when the steward's not there. But that's what the system is. And um, West Coast Railways have insisted it is perfectly safe. West Coast Railways Chairman David Smith said recently about this whole business, um, if you look at, and I am quoting, if you look at it sensibly, there have been no issues on slam door stock for the past 50 years, to my knowledge. And then they, the ORR, Come along, you can't do this, you can't do that. At the end of the day, there's a cost to all these things. Now, regarding the no issues to 50 years point, we've got a real issue with that. Because the evidence clearly suggests otherwise. 
On 28th of November 2000, Hansard records the following. I didn't write down where they were MPs for and the first names, but we'll put this on the website and we'll add those details. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Ruain, to ask the Secretary of State for the environment, transport and the regions, that takes you back, doesn't it, Richard? How many passenger deaths on British railways due to defective doors there were in each of the last 20 years? And Mr. Hill replied, Records are not kept on the number of passenger deaths resulting from defective doors. Figures are, however, kept on the number of passenger deaths resulting from falling from train doors. This table shows this information in the last 20 years. The numbers have reduced over recent years from a high of 26 in 1987 to two recorded during 1999-2000. It is not possible to say how many of these would have been as a result of defective doors. Now, there is then a table, which we'll also put on the website, from 1980 every year right down to 99,200. And just glancing down the table, the numbers of deaths each year are 14, 16, 11, 13, 14, 16, 12, 26, 19, and so on it goes to create a total of 235 fatalities between 1980 and 2000, falling from doors, whether defective or otherwise. Now, we asked West Coast Railways for a comment as to why they were seeking another exemption when the ORR had been pretty clear that they wouldn't get a blanket one. And they said... <clears throat> West Coast Railways has submitted a Regulation 5 RSR 1999 exemption application to the Office of Rail and Road and is in contact regularly with the, with the regulator. The contents of the submission remain private. We will not be clarifying the scope of the submission at this time. Now, a petition has also been started by the lady who runs the gift shop on the Jacobite and the Harry Potter-themed shop at Malague. Some of you may have seen her interviewed on the Sky News report on this a few nights ago. So kind of that's where we're up to. Um, Richard, do you want to think out loud about all that? Yeah, I mean, interesting about the, the petition is really interesting, OK, because when you look on the actual petition site and look at the comments, initially when I looked at it, it was an awful lot of the... Um, Oh, you know, health and safety gone mad. Uh, oh, back in my day, what we need is a return to common sense, all that kind of stuff. And I thought, well, that's sort of a bit of an echo chamber thing. And then actually, when you look, there's also quite a lot of, lot of other people saying, hang on a minute, this hasn't happened overnight. Um, this, is, this has been going on for quite a number of years. I mean, come on, you know, it's, got, it's almost like get with the program, really. So it was actually more balanced than I suppose I was perhaps f first expecting. Um, the it really interesting thing, I think, about this, and you read out those stats, which uh, are for the number of passenger deaths result, resulting from falling from train doors and whether they were defective or whether the passenger opened it or whatever they did, right? I mean, those are, those are, are, are fatalities. Now, there's one principle, which in the judicial review documentation is there as well, which is safety legislation and safety risk management is an evolving science. It doesn't sort of stay static, you know, as we learn. I mean, it's a bit like, you know, when we were kids, it was perfectly normal to get in a car without a seatbelt. I mean, yes. now you just, now you just wouldn't, I mean, or, unless you're an absolute numpty, you just wouldn't even think of it. It's automatic or ride a motorbike without a crash helmet. So it evolves over time. Um, and you can see evidence of the ORR's evolution in thinking. So again, I'm quoting back from the judicial review documentation. But um, what you see is that in 2014, so 10 years ago, the RR considered um, that Regulation 5 could potentially be repealed. But then in August 2016, a passenger died after putting their head out of a drop light window on the Gatwick Express and striking a signal gantry. Oh, I remember that, yeah. Yep. And then, a re I mean, these are all awful. But in December 2018, a train passenger on a Great Western high-speed train died after... Um, I think it was a she, wasn't it? Put put the head out of a drop light window and, and and struck a tree branch, and those two fatal incidents led the ORR to reevaluating the risks posed by the remaining hinge door rolling stock that had um, drop light drop windows lights on the main line, and that's what led to in 2019 the ORR saying, "Look, 
in 2023, fair warning, you're not going to be able to operate these without That's them. the final warning. That was the final warning. So, <clears throat> uh, again, it, it's an evolving science. Now, when the chairman of West Coast Railway says that, um, to his knowledge, there's been no issues with slam doors over 50 years, what we don't know is whether he's saying either on heritage lines or, or with charter trains or, or more generally, right? All we have is the data that you, you um, reported there. But also the um, uh, ORR point, uh, sorry, the judicial review said, and the ORR pointed out that actually there'd been two incidents on the claimant's own trains, the West Coast Railway's own trains. And it actually says the claimant contends that its method of operating its secondary door locks that you just explained is safe. But there have been several incidents on safety incidents on its trains, which indicate otherwise. And the claimant has not produced evidence of an investigation into the incidents or reflections on lessons learnt to the satisfaction of the specialist safety regulator. And the incidents that the uh, uh, the judge is referring to was on 2nd of October 2020, when one of West Coast Railways trains was dispatched from York Station with a door open. And then there was another one in June 2022, when a passenger alighted from one of their trains um, as it left the station, having overcome the steward, attempting to stop him and opening the door himself. And he was caught by platform staff as the train was moving. So I'm afraid to say, even on your own trains, West Coast Railways, there have been incidents with these doors. So it, it is it is a very tricky area. Um, how do we sum it up? Well, the judge who threw out the judicial review actually said it was common sense uh, that CDL be fitted. Um, not only that, the, there was a very interesting uh, uh, clause, if I can find it uh, very briefly, which actually made it clear. Uh, if I, here it is. Uh, and it's worth just reading this, right? On 26th of July, 2021, so this is almost three years ago, the ORR published an assessment of the costs of installing CDL. And it got the information from three train operators who had fitted it or were in the process of doing so. Now, these are the numbers then. The maximum cost to retrofit each carriage is £26,250, so 348000 for a 12-carriage train. The maximum number of trains operated by a single heritage train and operator in a day was four, making a cost of £1.393 million. Here's the point. This was said to be well below the notional economic value of preventing a fatality assessed by the Department for Transport on 2019 figures to be 2 million and 17,000. So what the ORR are saying is there's actually an economic rationale for doing um, to doing this from a, a preventing fatality point of view. So what what did you say on that cost Richard because I I, I saw James Shuttleworth the commercial manager of West Coast Railways on that Sky News report a few days ago saying it was going to cost them 7 million pounds to fix CDL. I haven't. Yeah, I, I saw the same thing. We, we've I've not seen the breakdown. Of the numbers they do have an awful lot of vehicles. Interestingly, interestingly, we understand that they have fitted hmm. CDL to their Mark II rolling stock. I think that's used on the is it on the Northern Bell Northern Bell service. Now, again, I, I, is that because it's easy to do, or is it? Because, I, I don't. I don't know. But as a principle, um, they've done it. They've done it. So if they've done it there, uh, you know, a reasonable person would say, well, why can't you do it uh, on on the Jacobite uh, steam train? I mean, other other operators have fitted it. So uh, LSL, Locomotive Services, which is a very big operator of, uh, of charter stock, have done it. And if others have done it, and let's say West Coast Railway uh, end up not having to, I don't know, but does that give those others? A, a, well, hang on, this is a distorted market. This well, is does not LSL a level have, for. does LSL then have a legal case to bring that they'd spent all this money that somebody else has just been let off from doing? If that's what happened, so yeah, it's that, possible. But it does feel to me, Nigel, as if now the you know the ORR have really now almost put said no. Uh, we said no, and, and we, we meant it, and we kind of meant no. And West Coast Railway seem to be saying, well, yeah, but 50 million for the economy of Scotland and you've got to, you've got to be reasonable. And it, it just feels as if we're now in a, 
it, it's it's a sort of standoff. It will be fascinating and and actually quite worrying for a lot of people. What happens next? I mean, what we're really saying is the ORR can't really back away from this now and retain any credibility, can it? It's it's very difficult to see how they change their stance unless um, the one thing they do do is if West Coast Railways say, okay, look, we're going to do it, but it's going to take X amount of time. And during that time, we need a, a, a sort of a temporary exemption to allow us just to physically do it. The ORR have said yes to that before. So that would be, you know, there, there would be some logic to that. But if if it just is, you must, we won't, that seems very difficult to resolve. I mean, that's that's not materially changing the decision. That's offering them a transitional period, which they've offered before. And it would be a reasonable thing to do. You can't suddenly overnight fit 20-odd carriages uh, with central door locking. So a transitional. But, but it does feel like the OR cannot now back away on the core principle of of, of having it done. Because I'm, it's probably entirely likely that Jeremy Hoskins is going to come down the road with a with one of my learned friends and his quill pen saying, hang on a moment. Yeah, we shall we shall watch with interest. I think the one thing that I would say, having looked at the whole thing, is you cannot in 2024 say, oh, it's going to be okay. Just use common sense. Let's just, you know, when I was a lad riding on the trains, um, you know, we all used common sense. That is not how safety uh, risk managing, management works in an evolving uh, environment. That's the one thing that I think we've just got to put to one side. This has got to be based on science and analysis and risk assessment. And one just point to leave before we go, you're right, this has been going on since 1999, so the best part of 25 years. And yet watching that Sky News report the other night, the the, the man in the street or on the roof of the top deck of the Clapham Omnibus would quite easily draw the conclusion that this is blown up recently and it's a big battle between elf and safety and officialdom, um, making life difficult for the little guy trying to do a decent job. That's not how it is. Well, it's a battle, but it's not a recent one. No, it's not. Okay, I'm sure we'll come back to this at some point. Um, and again, before we move on, thanks to Steph for doing an awful lot of research in uh, in all sorts of places to come up with the data that we needed to do that. So thanks, Steph. So there was white smoke last week. Moving on from Andy Street and Andy Burnham, the mayors of Birmingham and Manchester, with their alternative to HS2. But <laughs> you were left, you might well laugh, you were left bemused and thoroughly in Meldrew mode, I think, Richard, weren't you? It doesn't really work on radio, that does it? But as you say, as you were saying that, I was starting to smile. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah, I was. I was bemused is probably about right. Um, and I'll explain why, right, in, okay. in a minute. Um, um, but one of the reasons I was bemused, because it wasn't really, although it was kind of announced, it was announced in a very unusual way. It was kind of done as a bit of a social media release, really, rather than any report, or certainly any re I've not been able to find a report. Um, and one of, the, one of the most amazing things was the tweet that Andy Street, the mayor of Birmingham, put out, which was absolutely extraordinary. Shall I tell you why? I'm a gog, Richard. You're a gog. Then let me explain why. It was absolutely extraordinary. Unagog me. Um, we'll put a picture of the tweet up. But before we do for, that... For those watching on YouTube, the Spotify and Apple... <laughs> yeah, okay. Spotify and Apple people watching in black and white is between the pink and the green. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Touché. Yeah, yeah, all right. We have to be of a certain age to get the pop black joke as well. Yeah, I know. Yeah. There's the snooker know. joke. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll put it up in a minute. But first things first... In fairness to Andy Street and Andy Burnham, what they have done is they've kept the debate alive despite the Prime Minister's best efforts back in October last year. To so, kill the whole question, yeah. Absolutely. And they and they both said no, right? And they've kept it going. So that is we are we should all be indebted to them for that, right? And actually, just at that point, we should say that Andy Street deserves an especial doff of the cap as a conservative mayor swimming against the conservative current. I bet he wasn't popular in Downing Street. No, and, and that that true that is also very fair. So well okay. done, Andy. We respect that. But <laughs> oh, and the but now the but's coming because this tweet. This tweet that, if that was watching... time to perfection, wasn't it? 
Well, um, pat on the head and then slap. Well, tell me if I'm wrong in a minute. All right, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, the tweet came out, which which he may not have done. It might have been somebody from one of his team. Oh, gee, that's right. Okay, anyway. Keep um, going. Keep going, you fellow. I'll keep going. I'll keep going. And it, it said this. He said, three months ago, Andy Burnham and I commissioned work to look at improving connectivity between the West Midlands and Greater Manchester. Now we've reached a provisional conclusion build a new rail line and i kid you not there was an emoji of a little steam train isn't it isn't it amazing how that icon how, how many years is it since steam last operated? 1968 so it's 1968 70. okay so it's quite a long time ago well i'm i'm 58 this year so uh so that's 56 years right so that's yeah so a little but they so build a new railway line i suppose we should be grateful that they didn't come to any other conclusion because because any other conclusion would have been um let's game just say, over problematic uh, we do need a new line but then it also said our proposals which we i haven't seen in detail include private finance lower speeds and learning lessons from france and it is just worth very quickly talking about that i mean private finance i do worry that everybody goes oh it's okay we, we haven't got any public money so we'll do we'll get private finance to do it it's a little bit more complicated than that it is still fundamentally a loan i mean it is investment but it's a loan that has to be repaid and and actually it, it's not as straightforward as people think there are some examples of projects that have been done as concessions elsewhere in the world they've been refinanced using pension fund money uh that's very that's very cheap money but it's also money that is only invested when there's no risk so you can only do that when it's built and it's operating so to get it built and constructed is much more risky so private finance is not the panacea that a lot of people think it is. But nonetheless, we'll, we'll await and see what their proposals are. They say lower speeds. Well, hang on a minute. If you're going to run at lower speeds, that does have implications from the number of trains you need, the number of benefits you can get. I mean, it might actually be the answer, but, you know. And it restricts the capacity at terminals to turn them around and get them out again. It, it, it has some big operational implications. You're absolutely right. And then. It, learning lessons from France. Well, okay, that's, that's not of itself a daft idea at all. Um, there are some examples of new rail lines. I think, um, is it uh, Bordeaux to Tours, which has been done relatively recently, which, or, you know, it's the, one of the more recent ones where there's basically a concession that's done it. It's actually a relatively straightforward line to build, which actually phase 2A from Birmingham to Crewe is actually not dissimilar, really. Um, but don't forget, lessons from France. Well, some of the biggest French contractors who've done a lot of uh, TGV construction experience like Bouygues and Vinci and uh, FIH, they're all working on HS2 today. So you kind of could go and ask them today. And I, I know from, you know, when we've spoken to Guillaume Pepe, uh, SNCF's uh, president uh, and chief executive in the past, his godfather whole, of the TGV. Absolutely. His whole advice has always been, yeah, it, build it fast as fast as you can, as much as capacity you can, because you'll never regret either decision. So, I suspect if you actually ask the French for advice, you might you might get you might get back. Well, why did you cancel HS two? So, um, but look, at, at least the debate is carrying on. But it did make me sort of sit back and think. And the reason why I was really bemused, I think it's become two issues now. I really do. I think issue one is what we do between Birmingham and Crewe, right? Phase yes. 2A. And actually, David Higgins realised this when he was chair, chair of HS2. He knew that really finishing at a field in somewhere near Litchfield wasn't the right strategy. He really pushed to get it basically to done to Crewe as fast as possible. That was the right thing to do. And without that, we don't fix the West Coast Main Line. That is a real problem. So that's issue one. Issue two is what we do with Manchester. Ma going to Manchester has become quite problematic now. And we talk about Northern Powerhouse Rail in a minute, maybe. But I think it's become a little bit of a, of a mess. I'm not sure anybody's really sure what to do anymore. And um, I, I think it's become two issues. And the sooner we kind of just get that phase two A thing sorted to crew, the better. I don't know if you agree with that, but you know, I that, absolutely that agree. Is, is the issue. 2A in some way, shape, or form must happen. Well, it has to happen, Nigel, because the, the West Coast simply doesn't have the capacity to grow unless we do it. Do you now, think that they don't actually see that or they see it and don't care? 
Oh, no. Well, it depends who they is. I think if you're talking about Andy Burnham, Andy Street, yeah, I, I think they absolutely get it. I think, I think, you know, these are, you know, pretty switched on guys. I think they know that we've got to do that. Quite, you know, if you're the, if you're this conservative government, you might go, well, you know, somebody else's problem, right? So, which isn't very good, but whether the department really understand it, I, I oh. couldn't say, but I'm pretty confident um, Andy Street and Andy Burnham get it. But it, so there was another interesting announcement yesterday since we touched briefly on Northern Powerhouse Rail. So this one was, it didn't make the press particularly, but it's um, the, the Secretary of State for Transport, Mark Harper, made what's called a written statement oh, um, uh, to Parliament, yeah, about Northern Powerhouse Rail. And I won't bore people by reading it out, but basically what it is, is a decision by him. Um, I mean, interesting, I don't know, quite where the Department for Transport on this, but he's it's kind of quite a political thing, this. So what he's done is said, right, I've listened to all the stakeholders. When we announced Network North and 12 billion for Northern Powerhouse Rail, um, we asked we asked you to think about what you really, really wanted. And you've come back and you've told me that you really want something from Liverpool through Warrington to Manchester Airport to Manchester. I mean, That's using right. these tunnels that, that are going to get built. Uh, so we've listened to that and we absolutely agree. So what I'm going to do, I'm now going to repurpose the bill that was going through the house for phase 2B, but just be the bits of it that relate to Northern Powers Rail. So I'm going to take out the bits relating to HS2, we'll just do Northern Powers Rail. Now that has a number of implications. One, it really causes problems for how you get from Crewe to, to Manchester Airport, actually. I mean, kind of Burnham and Street and out on their own and northern powerhouse rail this is really complicated right i mean this idea oh we'll just go to warrington liverpool uh well <laughs> actually if you've looked at the route and getting under warrington bank key station you know that very well as i do, I do. it is massively complex and is going to take a long time to work out what to do then we've got a tunnel which I mean, this is not going to make a huge amount of difference to the end-to-end -end journey times, really, unless we're very careful. And I wonder whether we've all got in a bit of a mindset now in this country of nothing's good unless we build, we spend multiple billions and and do something massive and massive. Right? It's got to be perfect rather than good. That's actually a, a much pithier way of putting it, right? And I wonder if now what we have to do is go, well, it's okay to plan for these long-term things, but right, Manchester's transport system has got some real issues about some real capacity constraints. Leeds is the same, right? Yeah. And actually, I wonder whether, I, I, I would love to hear somebody say, do you know what, we're going to plan for this stuff for 15, 20, 25 years out, because that's the time frame for some of this NPR stuff. What can you do in the next five years? What can you do in the next 10 years? Are there little schemes here and there? Might not be quite as grand, but what can they do? Here's an example. A cord here and a... Yeah, no no more Ortsal cord, please. That, I'm and not a, I didn't that. say that. And a, connect, and a connection, <laughs> connection there. Yeah, but that's the point, isn't it? So you look at what this Midlands Rail Hub has done in the West Midlands, which Andy Street has been very very keen to promote and he's done quite a lot of work pushing that through so that's a couple of little cords near Bordsley, which has enabled all sorts of things to happen around the camp hill line through mosley and you know down to kingsville so that improves worcester to birmingham over to nunny and then you know cross city services get some capacity boost maybe that is what we need to be doing in manchester and Leeds. i mean they'll say they're doing that anyway but this northern powerhouse rail thing particularly now that that the Secretary of State's done this, and it's all subject to business case affordability. All subject the rest of it. to this, subject to all that. Of it, that. It's hedged around with so many caveats. I wonder whether, a bit <clears> like <throat> with the operations, where we say we need to get back to a boring, reliable, frequent yeah. railway. I wonder with projects, we also need to go. Well, what can we do now? I want to see stuff happen now, not when well, I'm like eighty-five. How many times? How many years have they been talking about that cord? Is it at Rufford? Uh, that will give access to trains from Liverpool to is it to the West Coast Main Line, and there's things like they could take those back-to-back -back buffer stops away at Ormskirk, um, and maybe put some hybrid trains on there and run direct trains from Liverpool into Preston, battery over the last section. Um, yeah, these I, are I modest schemes which nobody seems to be looking at now. It's almost as if we don't get out of bed for less than 100 million in it, or or a billion, or two billion. 
unless we start trying, unless we start working out how to do stuff that is a lot more cost effective, but quick. Yeah. I think we might lose, we might lose people on the way. And just because, you know, there are some, listen, I'm, you're, you and I are both from the North, right? I'm from Manchester, really. I mean, born in Oldham. And I think there's a little bit of, well, London's our crossrail, so we want something just as big. Well, I'm not convinced, maybe in in due course, but the stuff we could do now, I think there's a bit of a mindset shift. So that's what, I, I think don't know, I realise that's going off at a bit of a tangent. No, it's, but a, really, what, it's <laughs> a really good point. I mean, is Burnham still going on about his underground station at Piccadilly? I haven't heard that for a bit. No, well, in Mark Harper's statement yesterday, it talks about um, the the uh, Northern Powers wanting to look at uh, alternative station solutions in Manchester, which will include that underground. I mean, that is going to be eye-wateringly um, expensive, you know, and I don't know. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing, but the danger at the moment is it's all, we've got to wait 15, 20, 25 years. And that and the problem with that is I think people have kind of we'll, we'll have big issues if we do that. Gobsmackingly expensive. You're talking about lessons from the continent. How about learning a lesson for Germany? Is it Stuttgart station, which is a terminus that they're converting into a through station with underground platforms? And it is, I think, years behind and hugely over budget. Uh, yeah, sometimes, um, as you Pithley said, you know, perfection can be the enemy of, yeah. of of the good, and I think there needs to be a little bit of a, a bit mean, of a reset. It's a bit of a balance, isn't it? Because no, none of us like the expression "oh, it'll do." Um, we want to get the, but we're going to get the best bang for our buck that that, that happens at the time. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. we can beat the government over its own head with its own stick. Saying, "All right, what about all this HS two money you're redirecting? Why not redirect that to a load of small schemes?" Well, uh, I mean, the they'll, argue the they, persuasion. they'll argue they are, but I'd like to see none of them going into road schemes. Well, yeah. Hey ho. Hey ho. There we go. Okay, right. As we um, watch the tail lights of that story disappear round the curve, we welcome the headlights of the the next cheery story, which is that we're back to more strike days being announced across the network. London Underground drivers have announced strike action on April 8th and May 4th, and they're ASLEF drivers. And drivers at 16 train operators, also ASLEF, have announced a new wave of strike days and another six days of overtime bans. Um, probably going to be greeted with an air of weary resignation and as, as trust by the public in the railway collapses yet further, Richard. And that's the problem, isn't it? it it's... It's just not getting resolved. I I thought um, I saw one two two things I thought were quite interesting. One was there was an exchange in the House of Commons where Rail Minister Hugh Merriman kind of indicated that he would be prepared to sit down and have a chat with that he uh, was actually due to me make a real enough that he so that looked. Now we don't know the detail. That is he going to talk about the strikes? We don't know. But the very fact of a meeting. I agree. So that, and you know, I know we, we we beat them up, but Hugh Merriman does always strike us as a guy who cares and is prepared if he can, and the system allows him to engage. So that's a that's a uh, good. Thing. And we've always said that it was yeah. based enthusiasm, regardless. Yeah. There was a second thing I thought was really interesting. I know these are just tweets amongst you know people like us who just who just chat about this stuff. But there's been a bit of a debate about what Labour's policy is going oh. to be for rail. And Roger Ford uh, tweeted the following. He said, a good post-election strategy for Labour would be, one, settle the Aslef dispute. Two, don't distract the railway for the next 12 months while it gets back to providing a boring and reliable service and goes for growth. Three, consult with the industry on next steps. Four, do no harm. And I was compelled to go, that, that, that's the plan. Do that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so that struck me as that's a very sensible um, plan. And, you, and um, you know, number one was Aslef. And you're right. That was in, you know, <clears throat> a part of a, a long debate about Labour's transport policy in that Stephen Morgan, the Shadow Rail Minister, and Louise Haig, the Shadow Secretary of State, do nothing but run through a litany of why the current system is wrong and conservative failings without giving any detail about what they would do as an alternative other than 
public ownership like it's some kind of magic wand and i have to say i'm really fed up with that of course there's a few no i know, I know a few are. defenders cropped up and said oh well yeah but if they announce anything the conservatives will steal the policy well that's treating the the, the, the voters like fools we've been left till the last minute before we're given any options in detail and voters are savvier than i think either the parties or some of these commentators give them credit for. Voters mm. see through this sort of stuff. And as railways are never an election issue, surely there's an opportunity here for Labour to corner the railway vote um, and get them on side by just saying what they're going to do. Now, do they not know or do they just not want to say? My gut feel is they don't know. Well, look, you've been really clear on this. I mean, this is one of the areas where we, slightly, dis we slightly disagree, right? And I think it's actually quite rational from a political point of view, to keep your powder dry, um, at, at, certainly at the moment, you know, the Conservatives are doing such a good job of wrecking their own chances. Why, why upset the apple cut? I do take your point about um, being transparent, but um, I also agree with you that railways aren't, you know, transport's not really an election issue. It uh, never is. But, never has been. Never so will be. So it's frustrating for us, but I can kind of see why they, they, they do <laughs> what, what they do. Well, there's going to come a point where they've got to, um, what's that wonderful old expression, put politely, perform or get off the pot. Um, well, that's and... true. One one thing, <laughs> sorry, that made me smile. Uh, one thing just worth bearing in mind, if anybody who's listening isn't aware of what the current issues are with between ASLEF and the train operators and the government, if you like, because they haven't changed. No. Right? Um, do listen to our interview with um, Mick, Mick Whelan, Whelan, which was, you, you might, not agree with it all you might not agree with much of it but you will find it informative interesting it's entertaining he was a terrific guest he was um, and um and it, it was great so do listen to that yeah he caught you off guard towards the end for sure <laughs> yeah yeah i think it was a fairly score draw wasn't it but anyway there you go. it was but i mean it was an objective <laughs> conversation i think yeah. he enjoyed it we enjoyed it and it yeah. was informative yeah. Um, I think there was a settlement this week, wasn't there, B between Avanti and Aslef drivers? I saw some headlines about overtime payments going up from 125 to £600, which had the Daily Mail clutching its pearls. Well, if you don't have enough drivers, you're going to end up having to do deals on overtime and rest day working. I, I, we need to look into that one in a bit more detail. The, the, the numbers were pretty eye-watering, really. We we absolutely do, but um, the words of uh, of one Graham Eccles are ringing in my ears that at some point you have to buy the piece. Yeah, um, and yeah. maybe that's incidentally on the subject of Graham Eccles, he's been playing an absolute blinder recently on Twitter in his in in, in the form of elder statesman, old sage, and he really made me laugh out loud the other day with a suggestion which I actually think is quite good. And he, what he effectively said was, and I paraphrase: If you lot can't make your mind up what to do, get a dad's army of old fogies <laughs> like yeah. of me. Like me yeah. to to get, and of course you're thinking, oh, it's Gordon Pettit, Bob Breitwell, and Chris Green. You could put a dad's army together of uh, of old stages to be a bit of a think tank or a star chamber, or call it what you. Will. Anyway, that really made me laugh because Graham's text tweets always make sense. He reposted his very long thread about the Avanti. Um, yes, he did. Which, yeah, is, was... which again is is worth a reread. But you're right, Roger. Yeah. Roger Ford has been um, dropping the occasional very well aimed brick into the calm waters of various ponds with some uh, with some pithy and apt comments. You know, so keep it going, Rog. Keep it going, Graham. Should we do the quiz? Why not? Um, yeah, because oh, I'm looking forward to this. Hang well, on. let me let me settle down while you admit having made a mistake. Well. Um, <laughs> turns out we did make a bit of a mistake. Um, we, we, <laughs> yeah. Well, I well, well, uh, you know. Uh, 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 anyway, whatever. Um, whoever it was, well, the collective we. Uh, so, regular listeners will recall that we asked the question: which was the steepest uh, adhesion worked uh, railway in? Britain that saw had seen had seen regular passenger services, so it could be one that was open today, or it could be one that was closed, right? And we had lots of—I mean, it generated massive numbers of of uh, comments. wrong entries, uh, lots of wrong entries, but good entries nonetheless. You know, they were good. You know, um, and the winner we chose after much consideration debate was. Um, on the National Railway Network, the line from Middleton Junction to Worth, um, 
in uh, near Oldham, which we said had a gradient of one in 27. And then some bright spark pointed out that we hadn't said it had to be on the national network and therefore the DLR coming out of Bank Station, where it's much deeper than that, um, was um, was legitimate. And we agreed with both. So we awarded two mugs. Um, However, Leslie Gilpin Railways, that is his his, his handle pointed out uh, that we had missed, find. we'd missed one. Uh, the Lauker Light Railway. This is why I think you are culpable here, Mr. Harris, because this is West Cumbria, right? <laughs> oh, right? right. So I should know. Absolutely, you should know. Absolutely, you should know. Um, pointed out that the Lauker Light Railway um, between June 1913 and I think uh, for 12 years thereafter did operate a passenger service on its line. It's right on the coast near Workington in Cumbria. Okay. It's across and, some godforsaken moor. Um, said Nigel Harris about the stunning beauty of the West Cumbrian coast. Anyway. The energy um, coastline. <laughs> anyway, um, Mr. Uh, Gilpin pointed this out, and we did indeed have a look. And sure enough, on the Lauka Light Railway website, which is really interesting, actually, um, it says, following the stop at Archer Street Halt, the trains were immediately faced with a cruel 285 yards at 1 in 17 up to Copperus Hill. It was the steepest gradient in Britain to have carried adhesion worked passenger trains. I wage that 99% of Green Signal's audience have never even heard of Lauka and certainly couldn't spell it, even if they had. Well, that's both of those are possible. Because it's not like Lauka, uh, you know. It's not. No, L-O-W-C-A. Um, but nonetheless, uh, so well done, Mr. Gilpin, for pointing out. You don't Said get, he through gritted teeth. <laughs> yes. You don't get a mug because you didn't put the answer in during the um, the quiz time allotted. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. So there. <laughs> so there, but you are correct. So well done. You, you, get, a, you get a virtual gold star. Anyway... On to this week's quiz. We've got, sorry, last week's quiz. Uh, we went for a slightly easy one. Which town is reputed to be England's smallest that also has a railway station? Uh, the answer, if you do it on the basis of um, area and the generally accepted definition of a town, is Manningtree on the Great Eastern Main Line. So well done to Ben Borton Payne on YouTube. It was very quick with the correct answer that it, it was, was Manningtree. I saw it, yeah. It was lightning, wasn't it? Um, so do drop us an email, Ben, on info at greensignals.org, and we can send your mug. I've got about five going out today, hopefully, if the Royal Mail turn up. So all those who are expecting moves will get them shortly. Does that include me and Steph? No. So on to uh, this week's uh, question. Um, still haven't, got, still haven't oh, got one. Hence, I'm right. using my LNER travel mug. There you go. Right. Um, this week's question. Where... In the UK, is there a an example of a locomotive going sideways as part of a regular passenger service? Good question. If Good you know, question. I'll say it again, just in case, you know, because some people say, oh, I didn't quite catch it. So where in the UK is there an example of a locomotive going sideways as part of a regular passenger service? If you think, you know, usual... Uh, Comment, let us know either by YouTube or Twitter or send us an email. And um, mm. you'll get something, if you get it right, that Steph and I still haven't got, which is a Green Signals mug. Yeah, indeed. Not taking right. the hint. You're just not taking the hint. I'm not biting today. Right. Go on, okay. get on with it. Right. Let, let us move on to some genuinely hooray good news Rail journeys are up 20%. Let me say that again. Rail journeys are up 20%. According to the latest figures from the ORR, there were a total of 417, 417 million journeys made by rail in the most recent quarter, October to December 31st, which is a 20% increase on the 348 million journeys in the same quarter in 2022. All operators, all, had more passenger journeys compared with last year. And that even goes for Heathrow Express, which increased by 5% despite the Elizabethan line opening and taking a slice of its pie. 
there's a really very encouraging upward trend in the numbers now. Long may it continue. And, of course, it completely undermines the government's refrain, part of which was used to destroy HS2 Phase 2, the oh, use of the railways changed following COVID. You know, they really are coming back now, aren't they? They are. That last 20%, above yeah. 80%, is starting to come back. That is, they're great numbers, aren't they? They are fantastic <clears throat> numbers. Am I louder, however? Oh, God. No, no, it's just, listen, we're, we are... Never knowingly cheered up, eh? No, no, this this podcast is all about informed comment, okay? Right? So yeah. I share your joy and delight, right? Like, have you um, let your face know? <laughs> so, <laughs> very good. That's better. It is worth looking, we'll put a link on the website, to the GB Rail Transition Team's um, detailed analysis that they do on the trends. Um, which uh, Rufus Boyd, I think, put something out on LinkedIn about it recently. It is a good companion to the ORR numbers because it talks about the mix, the passenger mix. Because one of the challenges is that although volumes are are on the rise, yield from fares is not necessarily tracking the same because of the change of mix. And so that creates a, a bit of, a, a, if you like, a funding gap if your objective is to get back to the same position you were in but before. You've got so to that's start, the only point. Yeah. But you've got to start with more numbers and then try, oh, well, listen, I, I and then try and resolve the, the, the fares thing thereafter, couldn't agree. It? Couldn't agree more. But, um, you know, the government's argument, the cancellation of HS2, was a lot of it was down to business changing, which is high yield. But I, I don't, we, listen, we don't buy that for lots of reasons because we all look at, well, where's it going to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years? You've got to build for growth. Oh, no, no. I, I completely agree with that. Um, but the GBRTT's analysis is quite interesting as a, as, as a, you know, a richness of the data. Richness of the data, there's a good <laughs> expression. And what a good expression to close on, because after a fairly high-octane, high-caliber edition of Green Signals, we have reached the end. Um, it has been fairly tough stuff and some detailed stuff to absorb but we hope you've enjoyed it it took a took a lot of work and again let me thank steph for doing such a massive amount of research into all sorts of obscure places to come up with the numbers quotes and stats and everything else that we needed for the particularly for the west coast thing and that's about all we got time for this week thanks so much for watching or listening on your chosen platform um, if you're on YouTube, please don't forget to subscribe and give us a thumbs up and leave a comment. Um, it all really helps. And uh, we're well on our way to 2,000 subscribers now. And we'll let you know how long other podcasters take to get to there when we <clears throat> excuse me, get there. And most importantly, join us again next week. But for now, from a lovely spring day in... Um, I can't remember where I am myself now, in Lincolnshire. <laughs> oh, dear. There's so many comments I could say, but I will refrain from any of them. Uh, uh, well, also from me, uh, Richard Bowker here in Wiltshire, where the sun has come out whilst we've been recording. So it's, it's spring is back. Shining on the righteous. So thanks ever so much for your support. Do keep listening. Keep the comments coming, all of the above. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for being with us. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.